This is going to be a really fascinating session. We are delighted to welcome two leaders in this space, Shashank Salmanth, who is the CEO of Global Logic, which is one of the most innovative companies, helping a lot of companies digitally transform themselves, and uh, Alejandro Martinez Galindo, who is the CIO at Walgreens. And uh, as you know, we, we've talked, we've sort of alluded to what's going on in the retail healthcare space with Don Jones and so much, so on. But I think there's, there's so much transformation going on right now. That this is going to be uh, fun to hear about what uh, these two gentlemen are doing. So I'm going to start with you, Shashank. So since you obviously are working with a lot of world-leading companies on their digital transformation journeys, how do you at Global Logic view digital transformation? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex topic. A lot of things are written on this. And naturally, you guys are from universities and businesses, so you know it much better. We define digital transformation or digital in two different buckets. One is the transformation innovation piece, and the other is the modernization piece. The modernization piece is getting on the cloud and using the new technologies, which happens once in every seven to 10 years when the new cycle comes. The transformation piece is over here. We, you try to challenge yourself or challenge the enterprises to reimagine their future. That's where the design element comes into picture. And that is the area, if you do not know the segment or the particular space is much better in terms of industry. Once design uh, challenges the institutions, that time you start redrawing the consumer journeys i.e. is not just technology, because you have to change every single thing along with that, including ecosystem, what you sell, whom you sell, how you sell, whom you interact with, supply chain, all those areas. Once you figure that out, and in terms of how it's going to work in the new, new consumerization world and new democratization world, in that case, you apply the complex technologies to make it happen. While all this is going on, every single data point, from right from sensors to the emails to the navigation map, GIS data, you keep on tracking. You Sometimes you don't know what you're going to do with it, but you want to use it. And all this has to happen at the near real time. We call it rolling thunder. That's what a consumer wants. Rolling thunder. That's what we call. And, and, and that all comes together, and that's where actually global logic comes to the picture. So if you see my company, uh, we have almost 14,000 employees all around the world. They are designers, they are engineers, they are data engineers, and they are actually management uh, consultants to how to make it happen. That's what we call digital transformation. So tell us a little more about this design thing, because you believe very strongly that design should precede any digital transformation. So give us an example or two of sort of how you think about that. Traditionally, I think I'm a, I'm a software engineer, and I, I cut my teeth in IBM and HP in, in R&D. So we used to take pride in terms of what is feasible by technology, and then we used to add user interface later. The things have changed after Apple. I think things started changing because the initial thesis was consumer may not know what they want, so I think we have to give them something different. That is why actually Johnny Ivey's thesis was. I'm not saying that I'm subscribing to that or not, but what started, we started realizing is there is a certain acumen, there are certain class of people, certain kind of people which challenge the status quo. They actually start questioning all the way from organization design to exactly whom you sell, what you sell, and how you sell. This is a design talent. There are people actually, we think that they're born different. They're very challenging to work with. Uh, their agile mode is probably 10 iteration in a day. Engineers agile is probably, if you're lucky, in three, one in three weeks. And they are not perfectionists. They're that's a good to... engineer, actually. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And those are the designers. So we have close to around 70 of these very high-end designers, which work with the executive management CEO all the way down. And they are paired up with close to around 350 which are guys who can translate that into physical artifacts. Once that is going on, parallelly you have to link design with engineering and where the actually art comes. Because these two disciplines are completely different. Designers do not have boundaries, engineers have boundaries. Designers are not perfectionists, engineers are perfectionists. Designers believe they have to change everything every two or three weeks or two or three days. Engineers want to get perfectionized over a period of time. And that is the area between our studios and engineering. We spend almost close to around three to four years to try to perfect that. So do you have a boxing ring or what do you have to? Uh, I think that's what happens if you do it realistically. So we have, we have five design studios around the world and you need to have a little bit of a local sense on that. And we have 26 engineering labs. And you need to have respect for each other. You do not try to teach each other your philosophy or methodology or your book. But I think you have to, you have to, you have to, you have to marry that together to have an iterative process, which works in Agile beautifully to get it out in the market. Alejandro, so how does this work at your company when you do design thinking or reimagine? Tell us a little bit about your story at Walgreens. Excellent, thank you. If you think for a minute, what is Walgreens? We have the 
retail in the front of the store, you have pharmacy, you have the beauty, and you have the healthcare. So if you think for a minute, what is going on in the retail and the pressures that it, that segment is under, everybody understand there's a major disruption. The second element in, in, in the beauty space, we know that Sephora and others are pushing really hard to create disruption. And Today we're saying Alta Beauty, by the way, because we featured the CEO this morning. Absolutely. And, and the other piece of the equation is the pharmacy. And if you read the press and you follow healthcare, it's just a matter of time that the big guys are going to start to move into the pharmacy. So what option do you have? The only option is reinvent yourself. So let me share with, with you some of the activities that we're doing. In the retail space, it's important. How can you really start to attract more customers? I would like to, to, to clarify something. We, are, we have more than 10,000 stores around the US, and around 70% of the US population is less than five minutes walk from a Walgreens. A walk. So the important topic is how can you leverage your assets to compete with a, with, a, with, a, with a software company. So more than 10 million customers visit us on a daily basis. So the first topic is in the retail. How can you make your assortment more attractive to customers? So we are creating a partnership for companies uh, like uh, Kroger that we're bringing, for instance, fresh, organic, and others. And we're working with the digital capabilities to create click and collect, ship to home, Omnichannel capability. So that's one of the examples. That'll that be a Kroger store within your store? Yes. So that is, is about. You heard it here first. It's, it's, a, it's public information. <laughs> you took away my. Oh, that. You still heard it, heard it here first, but I bet you guys are here. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the second important element is we create an important partnership also with FedEx. It's not a secret the amount of packages that are lost or in our Porsche. Right? So what we are doing is creating a, a tremendous partnership with them. You can pick or ship from the Walgreens stores. And as I said, seven minutes, seven minutes away from home is interesting. So we are attract, attracting a very interest, interesting traffic. Uh, the other element that we are doing, uh, it's uh, in, the, in, the, in the beauty space, for instance, we create an important partnership with companies like Breachbox. I'm not sure if the, if the audience is familiar with, but basically it's an online retailer that based on subscription, send you on a monthly basis or weekly basis the, the assortment that you have chosen. So interesting, we're getting tremendous capabilities also with that partnership. And in the pharmacy, which is our strength, um, we are building a very important platform that will empower us to enable the pharmacy as a service, whatever that means. I would like to leave it to your interpretation. So we are building a fantastic platform that will help us to create those energies, synergies. Now, if you think for a minute, other partnerships that are public, that I'm in in the in the, uh, allowed to disclose, we create a partnership with Burley recently. With him, I'm sorry? Burley. Mm -hmm. On the other side, we have a, par a partnership with Microsoft. And we are going to start to run a pilot around diabetes. Uh, one of our objectives is how can we really disrupt healthcare? If you think for a minute what we can do with the power of Burley, the algorithm in Eaton's, the artificial intelligence, and the other element, if you think for a minute, all the millions and millions of records that we have about iris scan from our patients. If you think for a minute also what can be done with real-time glucose monitoring devices that we have signed a couple of partnerships, and we have your prescription, adherence, close the loop, and just imagine what everybody talks about it, is a reality today. So we are starting to embrace in those level of disruption because at the end of the day, what our objective is, how can you really be customer obsessed and really help to disrupt the healthcare system, which is broken? That's in a nutshell what we're doing. I do believe that uh, th that we're doing is perhaps the largest digital transformation of modern times because in parallel, we are revamping all our platforms. You name it, supply chain, HR, uh, point of sale, et cetera, et cetera. Everything is, has to be done at the same time. Now, one of the reasons I was so excited to have both of you here was because this is an absolutely sort of, you can't imagine a much larger scale of transformation, right? Because, but when I hear you talk, you're talking about, so you're reinventing retail within sort of the retail section of your thing. You're 
of your stores. You're allowing or partnering with Kroger to sell their merchandise at, at your stores because that, I assume, gets you more foot traffic. Then you, you, you describe the beauty section as a little bit different, but there you've got some real serious competitors. And then, of course, uh, the whole pharmacy business. And I'm still trying to figure out what pharmacy as a service means, but we'll see. We will see. But, you know, uh, right after lunch, we had Don Jones, who spends a lot of time in this space, talk about a situation where, um, you know, if you are an Amazon Prime customer and they already have, they bought PillPack, which by itself is a, is a fairly small company, but they have platforms and so on. The idea was you go see a physician and, um, you know, before, because one of the biggest problems, people don't fulfill their, they fill their prescriptions very often. So you get two hour delivery. So when you get home from the doctor, you already have the prescription waiting for you. Um, do you think that is where sort of the Amazon plays and how are you thinking about that? Might, might, might be, might be. I, I, I'd rather not talk about them. I, I'd, rather, <laughs> I'd rather talk about what we are doing okay, to, so fight, to fight, fight against them. So something important in the healthcare space is, through, again, through partnership. At the end of the day, what we're trying to be is cost, customer obsess, right? So we're starting, but through partnership, we're starting to add in our pharmacies additional uh, services. Let me give you an idea. We're creating a partnership with Quest Labs, so you can do now your blood works in, in, the, in the pharmacies. We are creating some specific uh, partnerships with, uh, in order to be able to get uh, your glasses, audition, and, and so on. So we're starting to create an ecosystem that we're starting to become a healthcare company and is a convenience company and is close to home, right? It's what we're doing is strengthen our relationship with the customers and the patients because at the end of the day, something that is quite important. If you really analyze professions or professionals that you trust, you don't trust politicians, you don't trust lawyers, you trust your pharmacists. <laughs> Because it's, it's quite meaningful, because when you go to the pharmacy, you know that perhaps you forgot to, to mention to your physician that you are taking or you have been taking specific drugs. When you go to the pharmacy, the pharmacist does medical evaluation and we have all your history. So perhaps you can have an event and an incident because again, you forgot to mention, and it's the value added and the relationship that we create with the patient that is tremendous value for us. So there's so many ideas going on simultaneously. I'm just struck by sort of the ideation process that you must have had to go through to even come up with all of these ideas. Can you shed some light, not just sort of no, no competitor secrets, of course, but just like, how did you sort of, like, what was the process by which you generated all of these different ideas? And then, of course, like you talked about, there's a whole set of technology challenges around putting platforms together. I, I think some of the fundamental for us is everything about needs to come from the CEO. Okay. I think this is important. This is not a case where a bunch of technologists or CIOs have approached or strategic planning has come to the CEO and said, hey, let's try to play transformation. No, it's the other way around. This is completely co coming top, top down and we have a very uh, well articulated strategy. We know the segments that we would like to address. We are using some uh, techniques like Shashan just mentioned about what, uh, how to create all the discovery process with design thinking, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think you need to be prepared for these kind of elements. Now, something that is important, change management. We are transforming the company from a traditional pharmacy into a tech company. Right. So Shashan, talk about that because, so, you know, a lot of the tech is going to be supplied by cloud providers and so on. So. How do you see sort of broadly, not just Walgreens, but from your experience, you know, serving so many different customers, what do you see, how do you see broadly sort of this whole shift into becoming, you know, our, our premise at the center is all companies need to be software companies. So how do you think about that? I, th I, th I think your premise is correct. I think it's all started by the tech companies getting into their space, which is the enterprise world. Right. That's what it's all started. And that is the way actually they're learning, saying that if you're enterprise world, we have to be tech companies to compete with the tech companies who are trying to come on the arts field, right? So we are seeing, if you take the advantage of global logic, we are seeing across six industries, communications and media. If we, we see that in automotive, <coughs> industrial, we are seeing that in financial tech, in, in med tech, retail CPG, and around the world. What, all, what are you seeing in each of these sectors? Each of the sectors we are seeing that, each of the company which are more forward leaning, trying to create a software company within. They may not call that, but that's what is happening. Right. Right. 
and 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 the, and the leadership has to come from the ceo for one simple reason and some of these ceos are technical guys they are technology guys like starbucks of the world or actually their ceo stefano is technology guy or bbvs ceo francisco is a technology guy at one time or some of them are technically curious and that is that is very essential element for that to 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 be to drive it why this simple reason if you just go on the conferry or the wall street research a typical ceo tenure is close to 8 years say for tenure is close to 5 years cio is around 4 years that means ceo is going to last much longer and if they start on digital because digital is not about trying to put lipstick on the pig or trying to have a app that is the way of doing the business right. so typically what a cio ceo or cfo is going to start the real beneficiary will be their successor which are going to come after that and that's where the company is going to survive and company is going to thrive so it has to start at that level once it starts at that the biggest challenge for us to convince them saying that this if technology is going to be your core it cannot be outsourced you can have a lot of partners like us and technology players which you mentioned a couple of the earlier they can help you they will be assistant to you but you have to create this core capability within the company and that's where it start i have a very simple philosophy i'm actually also student of history so if you see if you say digital transformation is the biggest transformation some transformation and is happening every 30 40 years technology was is debated whether it is a productivity tool or they really transform and there is a big debate which had variety of universities but if you go back such bigger transformations actually happen in a societal way by religion and what is most important for religion if you make software as religion you need to have a prophet right you need to have a book and you need to have a place barring actually greeks and probably indians because those are different religions there are multiple gods but if you <laughs> if you take those together that prophet for such a transformation is the ceo because he is going to have much longer term and much much broader view and afford to take the risk that book actually needs to be a way to figure out that is there with this design or engineering you need to have your your way of operation and the companies like wargin companies like volvo bbva i visited bbva's campus they are not my client talk about bbva because i don't think if you from... visit bbva's campus in madrid what you see that they are like a google campus it's like actually it's a bank by the way design is exactly and you walk in over there you feel there is university it doesn't look like a financial company at all and and then you realize that yes what francisco did before in his career is also passed but what he did he realized that software or technology is my core and financial services happens to be just as a business and in that campus you'll realize that they have a way of operation 30000 engineers right they have operation and they have a place because that is a place not a worship but that is a place to work that's what exactly wallin did actually they created their own because if if the 100 billion dollar companies have to become tech companies that cannot be born within that company you have to actually separate it out and start creating that now some of the guys like bcg digital bcg digital or mckinsey digital they are trying to actually teach that to the enterprises saying that we can help you some company has further advanced say that we can do our own uh, volvo same story completely different geography right gothenburg in sweden they not only created their own tech companies like zenuity in the partnership with autolive completely software company but they also created their own software in house by hiring actually ericsson executives like udart so our belief is is not actually a fashion or not a choice enterprise have to survive they have to have their own design capability they have to have their own engineering capability and that is not outsourced that is the one which is fundamentally core to them yeah, and you know in the morning when we talk we talked a lot about this actually which is software uh, needs to be a core competence for all companies and clearly you can outsource a lot of work but there still has to be a fundamental sort of core that is the domain know how for the business that the you're in and if you look at this into all the hundred story that is actually evolving over time so you may say i know the retail pharmacy space but you actually <laughs> in some ways don't anymore because it's moving and so you need a lot of time um I want to get back to some so I'm going to ask you a provocative question. You think all CEOs these days need to have must be tech savvy, either curious or be um in tech themselves or from tech? I think answer is they should be technologically curious or they need to be technology executive. Every CEO cannot be technology executive, but they should be technologically curious. Whether it's Stefano from Volvine or whether essentially Hakan Samuel from Volvo uh if it is john fallon who is a financial guy from pearson which we work together they are all technically technologically curious is interestingly we push them to sit in the steering committee meeting of engineering uh engineering release management and only reason is because they need to understand because the first question a typical ceo gets said okay what is going to cost me and when you're going to deliver 
Right. It is not five years kind of operation. This is going to be on the rolling thunder basis, right? So our job as a company, our job is no more like my traditional competition like Accenture's job. Our job is to make them aware they need to be a technology company and we are going to help you build that. And to my surprise, uh, technology traditionally for many CEOs as something not to touch. Right. I think they, many of the CEOs did a lot of restructuring in their company. They never touch IT or never touch IT to touch actually the engineering functions. If you bring them in, they add more value because this is the area, CIO's job is not technology, it's actually job to bring businesses together. And that, that happens. Because uh, something important, Shashank, that I have observed, I, I think your CEO needs to be able to take some risk and some bold moves, right? If you're trying to analyze uh, competitive advantage projects with a traditional uh, return of investment, you would never do it. So it's, it's important if the CEO do not understand that how to really elaborate the journey around outcomes. Because now, now you start, you, it's, it's a mindset shift, right? The return on investment might be important for enterprise, traditional, non-competitive IT, that you have that as well, right? But if you really would like to create value, you need to think differently in the way that you quantify your projects, the way that yes. you approve your project. Because it's, it's, it's a journey, right? You're starting to continue building value and it's outcome driven, right? So you talk about inventory turns, you talk about how many transactions, how many new customers you have conquest, uh, is, your, is your, the size of your basket growing and, and so on. So, and I think that it's, it's very, just I want to add in that many companies when I, my CEOs, I sit together with them, they ask me a question as a fellow CEO, what is the digital quotient of global logic or digital quotient of its services for? And we, we struggle with that for quite some time. And we realize that even our business is changing. We do not call our company zoned around a particular vertical that many services company do. The biggest advantage we can do is we can, vertical boundaries are disappearing. We're trying to cross pollinate. What we learn in retail, we are applying actually to automotive. What we learn in automotive, we're applying in retail, in supply chain side. And then we are trying to democratize that information. That means our entire CTO's office is open. So we are saying that you can search Services company typically used to go to their clients and say, what do you want me to do and I can deliver? Right. It's no more that way. You come in, essentially it's like a university, you come in, you seek, you sip through that, and, should, and try to figure out what we can do together. No, I couldn't agree more because, you know, I've gotten a lot of advice over the years that I should have an industry vertical conference rather than a digital transformation conference. And I've just said no every single year because the whole idea is cross-pollination. I mean, Completely. you know, even backward industries sometimes have uh, an advantage that people don't realize. Uh, and I'll give you an example of what there's one CI I worked with. He worked for a fitness company, a big chain. And he said, please admit me to the group. I'm not as savvy as everybody else, but, you, but I need help. So we said, fine, we'll help you. Uh, and I have some really big CEOs, one from Disney and one of the th CIOs. And one of the things it turned out was they hadn't figured out how to get people with their passport admitted to all of their different parks. And if there's one technology that this fitness company had, you can go to any one of their gyms. That was the one thing that they were better at and nothing else. Uh, uh, so, so it's sort of an interesting thing why cross-pollination is so... I want to sort of leave you with, with the sort of an open-ended last question, and then we'll go to the audience for questions. So these are journeys, and Shashank, for you, the question is more about comparison because you've talked about BBVA, you've talked about JP Morgan, uh, you've obviously talked about Walgreens. I'd like to hear from both of you, uh, yours more about Walgreens. What is sort of the, the, the biggest challenges that you see in this journey? Because a lot of companies try, a lot of companies fail. So there's visioning, there's implementation, there's platform building, um, funding, governance, any number of things we could talk about. But let's pick a couple that you think are... I'll, I'll, I'll give actually broad ways, uh, and, and we have enough example of that. Digital transformation is only half of it is technology. The remaining half is changing the company uh, and try to work differently. Yes. And that is the biggest <laughs> challenge. Engineering and design can solve the feasibility problem of digital transformation. The viability problem is solved by the other half. So there is a large education firm we are working and we advise them saying that you do not, your digitization is not about digitizing the books and audios and videos. It's about how you can track student journey I graduated in one country, then I moved to the other country. I'm still learning. You need to have my journey, and then the content doesn't matter where it comes from, right? If it has to work that way, your all monetization models change. And this is actually a management problem, right? It's not a technology problem. And in that line, that is when the CEO actually need to see beyond three or four or five years tenure to around eight or 10 years. 
exactly what happened in SaaS world and technology industry. Used to be actually on-premise, and the SaaS, many companies went under. They were not able to come out of the, of the trough. The same thing is true in digital. Sometime you have to cannibalize something in order to actually see beyond. And if you do not do that, you will not even survive. So that part we find, uh, find the toughest. To the extent, the reason we want to work with the CEOs, not with the CIOs alone, because we want to actually relay that to the CEOs, and then we connect them to the fellow CEOs who are much further ahead in the game to say that this is the way the journey could be taken. So you're the first speaker who's made me sweat because I'm thinking education is a service now. <laughs> and trace people over the lifetime and say, hmm, okay, to the deans in the audience, will you please figure that out? Uh, um, Alejandro? No, I think um, I, I have been studying a lot of uh, IT transformation during my professional career. And uh, one of the important elements of success is the drive. Again, going back to the topic that I discussed before, it's important. For us, the trigger is the, the CEO. This is the agenda. Is how we're really transforming the company. And by the way, I don't think that we're transforming the company. It's not a, di it's not a digital transformation. What we're doing is a revolution. Right. It's a, we don't have time to transform. Right? So it needs to be a completely transformation, a, a revolution. Otherwise, the di new digital economies will kill us. Right? And everybody understand that. So again, the, the CEO set uh, the, the aggressive ob objective. He, he asks us, he's giving us tremendous empowerment. Obviously, he's asking us to take risks. And he's giving us all the resources that we require in order to ex achieve the objectives. Yeah. Now, it's not, a, not a, it's not a rosy story, right? The, you, you need to be able, you need to lim, be nimble to uh, fail fast and learn fast. So it's important that uh, you need to make, sh make sure Absolutely. that you move at a speed of light. And if you're going to be failing, it's better to fail fast, kill, kill that prototype, and it's working, continue evolving until you have a mature project. And by the way, this will never end. And even the last topic, we're changing <laughs> even the way that we're funding projects today because we're creating platforms. The platforms are self-sustained animals, and the business units are subscribing to them. So the concept of a project with us do not exist. The business unit subscribe to it. And if you achieve that moment, the platform is so say, sustainable in, in the long term. Uh, that, that makes it. And actually, if you think your point about revolution versus transformation, maybe I should change the name to the Center for Digital Revolution. Uh, um, but it's really powerful because every time you look back 10 years, for example, and you think about what, you know, we did that this morning, we sort of looked at where we were five years ago. And yes, there was lots of stumbles along the way, but the thing that you sort of always walk away with is we achieved a lot more in five years than we thought we would five years ago. And yes, we made mistakes on certain things that didn't work out, but overall the progress has been far faster than, than we could have expected. So you really do need to think sort of um, far forward uh, to figure out where to go. Well, let's turn it over to the audience for questions. There's one back there. So I, th I think, first of all, I think uh, we are... Uh, he must work for a competitor. Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I, I, I think if you see, uh, uh, I don't want to be an advertisement over here, but if you see the traditional IT services companies, multinationals, or even Indian players, their growth rate is somewhere between 6 to 8% right now, even including Accenture. The companies which are digital natives of services space, which is like us and a couple of other competition, their growth rate is close to around 20 to 25% organic. That's our growth rate, 23%. I'm a private little company by... CPBIB in Canada and, and, and Swiss guys. And that is the reason we have actually investors outside the US because they're much long term view. So uh, we believe that IT services company traditionally used to work for hire. They used to work when client used to tell them what to do. That is not the case today. The, they, the reason they are they have challenges, especially on the digital side or innovation side, not on the modernization, modernization <coughs> side, is if you go to the client and say, if I go to Alejandro and say that, Alejandro, what should I do for you? He said that we are going to figure out together. I don't know. You are going to, you are going to bring me in. We need to have an immersive workshop together to figure that out. And that will be an iterative process. There is no RFP or RFIs anymore. It's none. Probably less than 5% of our business comes from that. That's interesting. And, and, and that actually, that completely changed. That is one of the questions we ask the CEOs when they hire us. Three questions. Number one is, what do you think about digital transformation? Is the lipstick on the pig, or that is the way to do business? Who says lipstick on a pig? <laughs> <laughs> the second question is, is it among your top five priorities? And number three is, are you going to get us through procurement? I actually have a question for you. Do, do people actually give you the wrong answers for this? They do. They do. 
and there, and there are times people actually say that no i think you have to run through the procurement and procurement is going to run you through the least common cost point and that is the way you just walk because that is not the way to figure it out so we count ourselves as a digital native just like in their other segments companies are and we believe that the advantage companies like us we have we have nothing to cannibalize on the old models we don't have whereas some of the larger companies they have something to cannibalize so it services industry as such it has moved from 30% growth rate to around 6 7% my belief is a few of them will perish and few of them actually will resurrect and will come back accenture is a classic example they figured it way out under a late peer they did a beautiful job in that side the reason is they separated their business at accenture digital accenture was the third one we were the second one and arison was the first which now acquired baltran who acquired the design studios 2011 they acquired fior we acquired method so some of us were ahead in the game in that line other questions working both of you gentlemen talked about the need to not analyze long-term strategic projects by traditional ROI methods. Can a legacy business really make that transition before it feels the wolf circling and if so how? So I I do I do believe that the, uh, absolutely there's a, a a way to transform a legacy system into a digital enterprise. But what, some of the important, perhaps, element that we, when we start this journey, is that the, we starting to see the projects differently, right? We starting to set the vision. Of what is the platform? How are we going to be? And how are we going to be starting to fund the platform? What are competitive advantage? And we starting to really create the the organization that the capabilities around the organization is not just IT. Is also in the business. I think it's very important to make sure that you have product people that you have. Design people that you starting to create the capability because how are you going to be transforming a legacy organization into a digital enterprise if you do not focus mainly first in change? So, so that's that's the first topic that we do, and this, this, then we start in phase by phase. You said okay, phase one, how are we going to be changing the funding from projects into platforms? And we starting to uh, manage something like VCs, right? The project starting to compete for funding because at the end of the day, good, bad, or different. In the traditional enterprise, funded that limited, and perhaps uh, 80% of your budget is run, right? So, how can you really starting to transform a company from run into innovate? The second element is how can you really starting to squeeze as much as you can? You have your run. So, we have been ruthless in the run, and we have been changing the sourcing model. We have been changing the way that we run compute. We have even go and do things with our traditional vendors. to do things at risk that allow us to really find a way to source projects and sometimes uh, because it's, it's I'm not sure if I'm expressing my point is completely at risk so you starting to create the space by by again changing the way that you see projects and squeezing your run as much as you can because at the end of the day what matter here for for you for a traditional enterprise again is to find the inflection point where you become uh, you you can switch from run to innovate and there's a long journey for sure we can talk about it uh, after after the after the break but this is a way that the formula that we have uh, implemented and, and is is difficult right because in some cases uh, when you have your legacy team and your legacy system supporting you for 30 40 years sometimes even though that you have been trying to redeploy and repurpose this to train them to do more in the digital capabilities the statistics said that just 30% of the teams go through through that element right so, so we it, it, it's a complex topic so let's wrap we're running a little bit behind i've been getting the stop signal so let's thank shashank and alejandra for a fantastic panel